and and this is where I'm going to get myself into trouble. I think anybody can do anything. Anyone can make comics. Anyone can 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 do that. Um, but I think that the expectation that you're going to be able to make a living out of it, make a career out of it, you need to to understand that it's not an easy career to have. So, I mean, I'm, I tell people, if you want to make comics and, you know, have your day job and make comics for fun, go for it, do it. But realize that if you want a career in comics, you're going to have to, you know, eat, breathe, sleep, ingest comics. You know, I said on a panel, you're going to have to love comics and love working more than, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, alcohol, you know, birthdays, dinners, you know, all that stuff. Like you, those first couple of years, you need to immerse yourself 100% in it. And I don't know if everybody really realizes that. Let's talk dirty things like comic books and super. darlings. I am your adorable host, Eva Webb, and this is Titular Characters. Erica Schultz is a comic book writer and graphic novelist who has written for Marvel, DC, Image, Dynamite, 2000 AD, and other publishers in the U.S. and Europe. Her most recent work is the five-time Ringo-nominated series Forgotten Home for Comixology Originals and Legacy of Mandrake from Red 5 and Stonebot Comics. How are you today, Erica? I'm still alive and kicking. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I guess where I like to start these is with your journey. Uh, what inspired your, your love of comics? I've always really loved stories and storytelling since I was a kid. And my older brother used to read comics and I would just sort of, you know, pick up whatever he had. So basically, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, Batman, X-Men, um, like Jim Aparo, Batman kind of stuff, um, Claremont and Byrne, X-Men, uh, Spidey, things like that, uh, Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man. And I just, you know, I really enjoyed the process of, uh, of creating a story, of creating characters, creating worlds. And I didn't really think about writing comics as a career until uh, I had already had a career in advertising for several years. And then I uh, worked at a an art studio in New York and they were doing a lot of advertising work, but they were also doing um, work for the Astonishing X-Men motion comic, Gifted. So it was interesting because, you know, I was using my my advertising acumen in a comic sense and I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. You know, there there is a bit of overlap in terms of like technology and skill and stuff. Um, and then from there we were working on more and more comics in the studio and I was, you know, doing color assists and ink assists and such, uh, formatting pages. And I thought, you know, Hey, I, maybe I can do this. Um, so I started with the first book that I wrote, which was, uh, M3 and then, um, got that into the hands of some people at conventions and then it just sort of started snowballing from there, you know, writing more stuff, getting work for higher work and just, you know, continually adding to the portfolio. What's your favorite thing that you've worked on so far? I mean, your list is uh, really, really long, you know, when you go to Comixology. I don't know. I mean, it's weird. Like, so M3 was always the first comic that I ever did. And so that'll always have a special place in my heart. Um, I think... I, I really enjoyed Forgotten Home. That was a story that I had uh, wanted to get out there for a really long time. And it sort of also skirts the fantasy uh, genre that I'm not really, um, I don't really sort of dip my toe into a lot. Uh, I love 12 Devils Dancing because um, I don't really 
go for horror, but there was something about the story and these characters that I thought was really compelling that was best for the horror genre genre. Um, I loved working on Daredevil. I loved working on the Hulk girl short for DC. Um, I think every project has its ups and downs and every project has, you know, its highlights. I can't say that there's like one project that I like the best because it's kind of like, you know, if you forget to mention somebody in an acceptance speech, like you're always, you're always going to get that like rude email. So like, I almost don't want to <laughs> say who, what I like the best simply because like, I don't want to set myself up. Um, I did enjoy working on Mandrake a lot uh, because I was unfamiliar with the character. I, I mean, I knew who Mandrake was, uh, but I didn't really know the the backstory. Um, and so I really sort of delved into Lee Falk's original work. And, um, and it was interesting that, you know, uh, King Features said, you know, we have this idea of sort of not remaking Mandrake, but this idea of um, taking a... Uh, you know, taking the Mandrake universe and sort of adding to it and really enriching it more and, and blowing a lot of things out that were sort of just um, almost footnotes in the original work. So that was fun. I mean, being able to play in that world. So, I bet that would be exciting. Uh, Mandrake just has, has so much history behind him. You know, I mean, this is a comic that goes back, what, it's like uh, 80 years at this point. Yeah, I want to say yeah. this... I want to say it was uh, 1930, it was either like 37 or 39. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of history with that. And, and you know, we had the opportunity to, to sort of right some wrongs. You know, there are certain things that were, you know, albeit despicable, but socially acceptable at the time that we were able to, you know, bring into the 21st century, most specifically the character of Lothar and, you know, in the comic, in the the comic strips, I mean, he's sort of like this dim-witted sidekick. And in our book, we make him a father, we make him, you know, a friend, we make him somebody who's a partner as opposed to a sidekick. And we really give him some agency, and we give him an emotional arc, which is important, I think. That is a, a ton of fun. So um, when you write, where do you find? That comfortable emotional place that drives uh, creativity. What drives you? Um, for me, writing is really it's it's literally a compulsion. You know, it's something that I have to do. Um, I would even go so far as to say it's like an addiction. You know, I can't go more than a day without at least sitting down and writing something. Anybody who knows me knows that I always have a notebook, pen, and paper with me. I'll see something on the news, uh, something that was interesting. I have to jot it down. Like there's a notebook and pen in every single room in my house because if an idea comes to me and you never know when it's going to come to you. I got to write it down. It might not be something that I work on immediately, but it's something that I at least write down, get it out of my head. And then, you know, if I'm not working on, if I'm not working on a project specifically and I have a little time in my schedule, I'll go to the notebook and I'll sort of look and say, okay, what is it about any of these that are really like more fleshed out or have more legs than the others? And then start sort of, you know, working out more of it, working out the character, working out the world. I think that when it comes to storytelling, and this is what I teach at the Kubert School, is that basically you can start a story three different ways. You can start it with the world, the characters, and the plot. And whichever one you start with, the other two have, have to enrich and challenge the, the first. So if you start with the plot, you have to have a character who's going to be challenged by the plot and a world that that plot will live in. Uh, if you start with the world, you want something that's going to challenge your character. And you want a plot that's going to be able to, to live within there. And if you start with your character, you want to give them you know, a good arc but you also want to put them in situations and put them, you know, that are going to, you know, to, to not only challenge them, but to, to sort of test them. So sometimes, you know, when I'm just sort of sitting around, I'll, an idea will pop into my head and it could be any one of those things. It could be, you know, a, a type of world, a type of environment that is unique. Okay. So what kind of, 
what kind of story would live within this unique world? Or, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the story followed this particular person? Okay, well, what is this person's backstory? Where did this person come from? Or just, you know, like, boy meets girl, girl kills boy, you know, whatever. Like, what what's the world that, that it revolves around that? So how did you get into, uh, into teaching? Um, I was... Uh, the current president of the Kubert School was my editor at Dynamite. And um, I was asked to come and speak to the school, I want to say two years ago, maybe three years ago. And, you know, we did like kind of, uh, I guess almost like a spotlight panel with the school and the students could ask questions and such. And um, after that, a couple of months later, they, you know, they had said jokingly as I was leaving, you know, you should, you should maybe come and, and teach at the school, you know, ha ha kind of thing. And that, and I thought maybe in sort of a, uh, like a, a guest professor kind of capacity. Um, but then I was approached a couple months later about, you know, uh, teaching a couple of classes at the school more, you know, more full time. And I gave it some thought and I was like, you know what, this, this could be interesting. So, um, Last year, last school year, so I would say 2019 to 2020 uh, was my first uh, full year of teaching. Um, I teach uh, writing and imaginative drawing, and then I teach story adaptation. So I teach the second year students and the third year students at the Kubert School. Um, and it's been really interesting. I mean, it's it's interesting to see how other creatives formulate their ideas, how they implement them. And... I think it's interesting to to watch these, you know, young creatives sort of grow up and 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 become professionals, you know, because they start off as you know, hey, I'm the kid who can draw really well in high school, kind of thing. Um, all right, well, what are you going to do with that? Now you have now you want to make that a career. Let's show you how to not only continue working on your craft and become a bet even a better artist, but also how can you make that into a career. You know, it's not just, you know, drawing pinups, like there's actual, you know, jobs in art and you have to know how to get these jobs, you know, what specs are like, you know, so some of it comes down to like sort of analytical things and other others. It's just like, here's a script, you know, draw me a comic kind of thing. It is, it is interesting when I see a student really really get out there and really make something of themselves. And I just, I, I want them all to succeed. I really do. And, you know, I want, I want to know that they might not be learning the lesson in class, but hopefully they will learn it, you know, when they, when they get into the, to the real world. Nice. That's just, that just seems like it would be uh, so much fun, you know, just, just sitting there and, and just, sort of being present as uh, as people learn the skills that just sort of drive their careers. Hopefully they're paying attention. <laughs> right on. What's the uh, the motivation of people who are, are studying this kind of thing these days, you think? The motivation to create comics or the motivation to read comics? Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about the latter. Either one or both. Well, I think the motivation to create comics are definitely, I think everybody has something to say. Um, and I think that the pandemic having, you know, I think everybody is like, oh, I'd love to write that novel or, you know, draw that comic or, you know, tell that story somehow. I think the pandemic gave a lot of people what they perceived as an opportunity to do so. Um, I think that, you know, anyone... And, and this is where I'm going to get myself into trouble. I think anybody can do anything. Anyone can make comics. Anyone can, can, can do that. Um, but I think that the expectation that you're going to be able to make a living out of it, make a career out of it, you need to, to understand that it's not an easy career to have. So, I mean, I'm, I tell people, if you want to make comics and, you know, have your day job and make comics for fun, go for it, do it. But realize that if you want a career in comics, you're going to have to, you know, eat, breathe, sleep, ingest comics, you know, 
I said on a panel, you're going to have to love comics and love working more than, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, alcohol, you know, birthdays, dinners, you know, all that stuff. Like you, those first couple of years, you need to immerse yourself 100% in it. And I don't know if everybody really realizes that. Um, I think a lot of people just want to do comics because they love comics and they think that they have a story to tell and that's fine. Go for it. Um, but I don't think that everybody should think that they're going to be, you know, the next insert, you know, uh, insert fancy name here kind of thing simply because, you know, they write a comic. I also think that the propensity of, you know, streaming shows and stuff, making comics into uh, other medium, which is the question that I had posed with you earlier, I think that sort of has a lot of people with pipe dreams. And it may happen. And I could be completely wrong. I could be 100% wrong. But it's like the law of averages, you know? It's like the Beatles didn't think they were going to be the Beatles. Do you know what I mean? Oh, totally. So, so I think that, I think, I mean, I I have no preconceived notions about you know, where my next meal is coming from. Like, I know I'm going to be working on this, but when that project is over, you got to hustle and you have to continually hustle. And I think that a lot of people just think that if you have one big hit that, you know, you're going to be set. And it, that's really not the case at all. I was uh, talking with a girlfriend of mine recently and she's a writer for film and television. And she said, you know, it's interesting how you have one big hit and you think, hey, you know, uh, that's going to open doors for me. And it absolutely will. But it's not going to mean that you're going to be Steven Spielberg after one hit. You still have to hustle. You still have to, you know, take meetings. You still have to create stuff, whether it's commercial or not. So I think that I think the pandemic giving people more what's the word more than not downtime because, um, but I guess like more time at home, uh, had a lot of people thinking about creating comics and in terms of reading comics, I think a lot of people, you know, got back into comics once they were home. If they, you know, they were home with their kids, maybe they're introducing their kids to comics that they love, um, that they didn't think that they were going to. So I think, you know, as, as, and I'm, I'm by no means, what's the word I'm trying to look for? I'm by no, I'm by no means like Pollyanna, this pandemic, you know, 400 plus thousand people have passed just in this country alone. But I think that it has opened up opportunities for certain people to really engage in the medium of comics, but also to engage in creating comics, in experiencing comics with other people, if that makes sense. It totally does. I feel like there's there's just so much to uh, to unpack there. So I guess I would ask, you know, you're you're a new comics person. You've developed your script or your complete book or whatever. Um, do you find do you, do you have to do uh, just a ridiculous amount of knocking on doors with it? Where do you start? Well, if you're a writer, you're gonna have to um, make a comic. Uh, the first uh, San Diego Comic-Con that I went to, I think it was 2012, I watched a panel with Axel Alonso, who used to be at Marvel, and Sam Humphreys and Mark Brooks. And, you know, the first thing that Axel said is, if you're a comics writer, no one's going to read your script. And Sam Humphreys said, you got to put your money where your mouth is. And, that's, and that is something that I think not everybody realizes. When it comes to being a comics writer, you will have to finance a book. And that is, you know, that's obviously not something that people want to talk about, you know, never talk about sex, money and politics kind of thing. But that is that is the nitty gritty of it. You will have to finance a book. And once you have that book and it's complete, even if it's, you know, 10 pages or whatever, once you have that book completed and printed, that's what you will then, you know, show as like your portfolio piece, whereas an artist can do some sequential pieces and some pinups and that's a, you know, an editor is going to know within two turns of a portfolio page, whether or not they want to hire this artist. So writer has a little bit harder of uh, an uphill climb to break in. But once you're there, you know, I think 
I think what a lot of people think about is, well, I have this one comic story and it's the greatest comic story that has ever been written. And when I write it, everybody's going to want it. Image is going to want it or, you know, insert publisher's name here. I don't think that that's really what it's about. I think it's about create, for me at least, it's about creating. So create the story that you want to create, but don't put so much effort, not effort, excuse me, don't put so much stock in the fact that if it doesn't make it to image or to whoever, that it's a failure, that you're a failure or that they don't know what they're talking about. So there's like two sides to that. But I think that, I think a lot of people have this thing where they have like one idea and this one idea is going to be, you know, the million dollar idea kind of thing. And then they get very disappointed when they learn that it's not something that people are going to want to pay money for, or it's not something a publisher is going to, you know, want to back. The best thing about crowdfunding and Comixology Submit is that you can democratize comics uh, any way you want. You can monetize your comics by uploading them to Comixology Submit and get your comics out on your own at conventions. And, you know, let people sort of vote with their wallets kind of thing. But I think people have this idea that like their one, their one big idea is going to be it. And I think that that's kind of a myopic view to take. And again, I think it comes down to, are you looking to have a career in comics or are you looking to write this one story? And I think those are two very different paths. So you want to write this one story, great. You write this one story and then you find an artist. Where do you find artists? You can find them on social media. One thing about finding an artist on social media is a lot of artists will po- will post pinups. They will not post sequential art. Not all artists can do sequential art well. And that's something that's very important. I think that, and it's funny because I was having a conversation with someone about this earlier yesterday. I think that there's this idea that like comics are easy to make and they're not. Does money play a factor? Absolutely. But so does a lot of skill and a lot of know-how and a lot of knowledge. You know, you got to know how to put together a print-ready PDF file. You got to know how to letter a comic. You got to know how to, or you got people that you can hire to do these things. One of the main things that I find when I'm looking at scripts and doing script reviews is too many panels per page or way too much dialogue. A lot of people think about comics in the sense of like television and television is very talky. You know, two people on the screen having a conversation, you know, very dialogue heavy. That's not comics. You have literal physical real estate that you're going to be using up with word balloons. And a letterer is going to have to put them down and a letterer is going to be covering artwork that the artist spent time doing. So, you know, I'm constantly telling people like, you know, cut, you can't have, you know, nine, 10 panel pages over and over and over again. You know, I know some more well-known writers will have like the same panel, you know, for two pages and it's two people talking. Those writers can do that because they're those writers. You know, you kind of have to learn the rules before you can break them. That's just my opinion. And again, there are plenty of people that would disagree with me and they're perfectly happy to. Uh, But I think that, you know, you need to to think about comics in the specific medium that it is. Um, If you want to make a good movie, then go make a good movie. If you want to make a good comic, then make a good comic. Don't make a good, don't make a comic because you want to make a movie. And that's, again, like kind of where I was coming from with that question is this idea of, you know, people looking at comics as a stepping stone. And for me, I feel that that delegitimizes the medium of comics as, as a career, as a, as just a medium, as as, as a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry, my brain is like totally fried today. Um, but, you know, it sort of delegitimizes comics as like this sort of like viable option. Like when people say, oh, what do you do? And I say, I'm a writer. They're like, oh, what novels have you written? Well, I've written graphic novels. And then it's this weird sort of like, you know, strange cockeyed look of, oh, so you draw the pictures No. And then you have to, you know, go through and sort of explain the process. 
Whereas if I was doing just regular, you know, paperback novels, you don't have to go through such an explanation. You know, you don't have to, to, to do any justification. And maybe that's my own insecurity coming out where you sort of feel like have, you have to justify like, no, this is a real career, I promise you, uh, kind of thing. But I mean, it's, it's true. It, it really is true. Um, there's a funny story that Bill Sienkiewicz told me about how when he first started working in comics, he was also working in a bakery. And when people would ask him what, it, what he did, he would say he was a baker because he didn't want to tell them that he was a comics artist because he didn't think that they would think, take him seriously. You know, and this is Bill Sienkiewicz. I mean, you want to talk about legend. I mean, hello. So it, it, that, that sort of, I don't want to say stigma, because that's, that's the wrong word. But that sort of like strange look that you get when you tell people that you write comics, you know, you always have to explain it. Like every time we have somebody, like a handyman or somebody come to my house, my husband, it's... I, I begged him not to do this, but he frames a lot of my comics and he puts them up all over the house and he's way taller than I am. So I can't just like pull them off the walls because he puts them up high. So like any handyman that comes to the house, they're like, whoa, you have a lot of comics. It's like, oh yeah, my wife writes comics. And they're like, that's a thing. It's like, yeah, you're a plumber. That's your thing. I write comics. That's my thing. You know? So I think there's like a real sort of disconnect. And so like anybody who wants to I know it takes me like three bus trips and a subway to get back to the normal, you know, the actual question that you asked me, but I promise it's worth it. But, you know, so like anybody who actually wants to try and create their own comics, I think you really should educate yourself in the process of creating comics. Because if you're just like, oh, I wrote a script, I'm just going to hand it off to an artist. No, it's not, it's not how it works. There, there are so many more moving pieces uh, and it can be overwhelming, but also, you're not going to make anything good if you don't educate yourself about the other parts of it, you know? Absolutely. You know, it's it's funny you should mention uh, Hollywood and screenwriting, too, because I have talked to now, I think, three people that are that are uh, sort of coming from Hollywood industry. And the thing they tell me over and over and over again is that you just have so much more creative control in a comic than you ever would in a movie. If you're doing your own creator-owned book then yes, you do whatever you want, whatever, whatever your budget and your talent and your ability can allow, absolutely do it. But not if you're talking about work for higher comics, because they will give you sort of, in advertising, we call it mandatories. You know, they'll give you like a list of things. Well, the character can't do this, or you can't do that. Or, you know, you've got a four issue miniseries or five issue miniseries, whatever, like there's always parameters. Um, but if you're self-funding your own book and doing your own thing, then yeah, you could do anything that you want. Um, I think it was Orson Welles who said, though, the, um, the enemy of art is the absence of limitation. So I think that, you know, you need some type of parameters. You need some type of, you know, box to be in. I mean, they say, think out of the bo- outside the box. Well, you're still thinking inside a box. You're just thinking inside of the bigger box from the smaller box that they want you to think out of. I also think, though, that you can't just go to another medium and start writing. So, like, I know I would be a terrible novelist because, you know, I, I can't write, you know, 40, 50,000 words. My head would explode. But I know there are plenty of comics writers that are also novelists, and good for them. I mean, Alex Segur is one of them. Uh, I believe Leah Williams is another. You know, and great. If you guys can do that, God bless. You know, the more things that you can do, great. I know that with several screenwriters that I, you know, that I've taught online classes for writing, one thing about comics is that the structure of comics is you have one movement or action per panel, per person. It should be one movement or action per panel in general, but usually if you're dealing with an ensemble or something like that, you'll have other stuff going on. And a a common mistake that people do, especially people who come from the film or television, you know, writing side is they will write multiple actions in one panel. And that's not, that's not the way to do it. So there is a learning curve, but at the same time, you know, if I wanted to go into screenwriting, there's absolutely a learning curve as well. I think you just need to, it comes down to, you need to educate yourself. 
And one of the things that when I was talking about sort of like the delegitimization of comics as a career, one of the things that I think happens is people kind of say like, oh, well, I wrote a movie or I wrote a TV show. I could totally write a comic. And first of all, I think that kind of, you know, sounds like, oh, well, anybody can write a comic, which absolutely is not the case. Yes, anybody can write a comic if they, you know, educate themselves on the format of a comic and how to tell stories using the medium of comics. But it's not one of these things that you need to just like that you can just walk into. I didn't start writing comics until I was working on comics. I was working behind the scenes at a studio. I was typing up scripts. So I saw what the format looked like. Um, I was uh, inking backgrounds. I was doing digital cleanups. I was doing production. I was doing lettering. I was doing all these things, all these other parts of comics that I think make me a better writer because I have been uh, uh, privy to the other moving parts of comics. So I think like when I say like you need to educate yourself, I think part of that is try and letter your own comic, try and letter, you know, try and draw your own comic, even if it's a three panel, you know, comic strip, try and do that. Comics, like any other art form is about communication. So what are you trying to say? How many panels do you need to communicate this information? Try and pacing out a story. I always tell people, you know, Uh, Your first jobs, you know, in comics are likely going to be like anthologies. How do you tell a compelling story in, you know, five to eight pages? Well, you've got to make sure that you have a quick setup, that your character is relatable. And, you know, even if they're an alien, you know, that there's still something about them that makes them human, even though technically they're not human. But you know what I'm trying to say? Like that sort of like human connection and, you know, give them something compelling, to, to do, give them, give them stakes, um, you know, give them something that they want that they're not getting or something that they have that someone's taken from them. Um, that kind of thing. And, and really try and write a compelling five to eight page story, you know, beginning, middle, end. And it's tough, but it's a really good exercise. And, um, that's what I do with, a a lot of the online writing courses that I was teaching, you know, write an eight page story, and see how you can tell a beginning, a middle, and end. Give your characters an arc. Again, it's not really easy, but it, it is absolutely doable. It takes, but like everything, like everything, it takes practice. Screenwriting takes practice. Writing comics takes practice. So I, I just, you know, I want people to realize that it's not like the the cut and paste you know, just sit at your desk and write a comic, like to, to write a good, compelling comic in a proper format, in something that a letterer and an artist can, can decipher and turn into a visual piece of art. You know, you gotta, you gotta do a little research on that. Okay. So like, what do you think of, of the digital revolution in the new formats, like web comics and comicsology? Does it change what you have to do as a writer to make them work? Um, web, webtoon, I would say it does, uh, comiXology originals is, you know, like forgotten home. It is already broken up into what I would consider like more traditional American comic storytelling where, uh, you have like a, a set arc. So you've got, you know, four issues, five issues, eight issues, whatever. And that's your set story arc. When it comes to webtoons, I mean, it has much more of a, Uh, The way it was explained to me is it has much more of a Miyazaki kind of open world building kind of story where the story sort of meanders. And and that's more of like an Eastern style of storytelling um, where you're focused a lot more on the characters and their development and their evolution uh, as people and everything else sort of follows that versus the characters following a plot, like moving from A to B to C and and completing tasks to move to the next one. I think that would be considered more of like a a Western type of storytelling, whereas, you know, Webtoon and, you know, more of the anime manga types of storytelling is more focused on the characters. It's a little more existential and it's a lot less about, you know, slay the dragon save you know the princess and more about 
the journey internally and sometimes externally of the person who is going to slay the dragon. Does that make sense? But I think I think web webtoons are great. I mean, there are a lot of fantastic webtoons that are out there. I think it's a different type of storytelling. It's a much more it's a much more open ended type of storytelling, as opposed to you know comics that are sort of already set up in these sort of like you know write for the trade paperback kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like write a four issue story or a five issue story because that's what we're going to package and make into a trade paperback and you know that kind of thing. But I think, you know, I personally think that you should always have a beginning, a middle, and an end before you start. But your middle can be as long as you want it to be. And I think where sort of where something like Webtoons happens is it's a matter of, okay, well, your middle is going to be, I, I think they call them seasons on Webtoons. Is that is that correct? I think so, yes. So, yeah. So maybe whereas you're, you know, you would have a beginning would be in, in a regular comic, you'd have your, your opening, your beginning, your intro would be like one issue. Then you'd have the real sort of meat of your story would be like three, three and a half issues. And then, you know, you have your denouement, your, your sort of conclusion would be like that last issue. So I think for, you know, like webtoons, you could have like your first season could be like your introduction. And then, you know, you've got like 20 seasons in the middle, you know, before your last sort of conclusion kind of thing. But it also depends on the creator. I mean, I know creators that start stories and don't know the endings or they don't know the middles, you know, they, they, they know where it begins and where it ends and the middle will just sort of work itself out. I'm more of a planner. I, I like to outline things. I like to get, you know, really sort of in the nitty gritty of it and, and get very technical about it before I start writing uh, but that's just me. I was just reading a Twitter thread the other day saying, you know, just get that first draft out of you, you know, good, bad, indifferent, just get it out of you. Um, whereas I, I tend to spend a little more time with my outlines and, you know, my timelines and, you know, my, my story structure and things like that. There's a great, uh, you know, she's a graphic novelist and a novelist named Jenny Wood. And I remember being on a couple of panels with her and we'd always sort of get into this like play argument about how I can't write without an outline. And she's like, I can't write with an outline, you know? So it's, everybody's different, but it's just a matter of, for me, I think that it's just a different type of storytelling. And if you can shift your focus and your, your story to that other medium, go for it. So Erica, we are uh, approaching that point in the show where, uh, and I know we've, we've touched on it before, but would you mind talking about your question to the audience and their responses? Well, the question that I posed was that a lot of people are thinking of comics as a stepping stone to film, television, streaming. And my question was that, are there any comics out there that, that exist that you as, you know, you as the proverbial, you know, plural you think cannot be made into film, television, streaming show. And there were, there were some answers that I thought were very interesting. I think that you, there's a way to tell any story in any medium, but I think that you have to use that medium and, and make sure that the story is fitting that medium. And I think you see that a lot with adaptations you know, like you'll see a comic that will be adapted for a film or a TV show and that they sort of adjust it to fit better in that medium. There was a film that came out recently within the past few years called Ad Astra with Brad Pitt. And the film, I thought, and it's funny because one of my former students brought this up, it really is is not like a film that you think, you know, it's really, it's very cerebral. It's very, there's a lot of inner monologue. And I could see that film being a comic very, very easily. This idea of, um, you know, just shots of someone's face and inner monologue and these very small, short conversations with other people as he's going through. I'm not going to say it's a good film or a bad film. I, I think it's an interesting film. I, I would probably have to see it again to make more of a judgment on it. But I definitely could see that as as being done as a graphic novel because of how how quiet it is, if that makes sense. 
Like, it's really, it's like a quiet film. Even when, you know, they get into this, like, uh, I guess, like, kind of like a gun battle on the moon. It's still a, a quiet film. So I thought that, I, I just think that it's, that was an interesting sort of almost reverse engineer of, of what usually happens where, you know, you have a comic and then you make it into a movie and then vice versa. That, that's really interesting. Um, what do you think of, uh, well, I, I imagine there's a lot you can do in, in comics in, in particular where uh, you can do things with like fourth wall breaking and, you know, characters, you know, playing with the frames and different things you, you can do. I saw this, uh, this one comic, just recently, where uh, they, the whole thing was was told th- by by bending the medium and just doing really interesting things with the frames itself. I, with a book like that, I, I don't think you could really translate it. Um, do you remember the title of the book? Oh yeah, Tessellation. It's coming out. It was by Mike Phillips. I just interviewed him actually, which is how I saw it. A uh, really amazing book. See, like, I would say something like. So when Steranko was doing the the old Nick Fury books and it was this thing where you had to like literally like turn the book because it was a sort of like very um, graphic and and almost like Escher-esque kind of thing. Um, I think something like that you you wouldn't be able to put on film, but you could still get that sort of disorientation. You could find a way to simulate that. Is it going to be the same? Absolutely not. Is it going to elicit the same emotion or the same, you know, feelings? Maybe. I don't know. I also think, in all honesty, I think it also comes down to the to whoever's consuming it, whoever's reading the comic, who's ever watching the film or watching the show. I think it comes down to them. I mean, because you know that there will be people who are purists no matter what. So if, you know, a, a film is uh, being made that's an adaptation of a comic, there are people that are going to hate it no matter what, simply because the comic was the original medium. So, I mean, there's, you, you're going to find people like that on, on, on any side of, of any argument. So it's, it's almost a moot point. But I, I think, you know, I don't want to say there's, there are things that can never be made into film from comics, but I think it comes down to a matter of you can't make it shot for shot. You know what I mean? Like there are a lot of films that are made from comics that you can see some moments that you can take directly from the comic, but on the whole, it's not like a storyboard. I think that comics have been seen more, more so lately as storyboards for films. And I don't think that that's, that's right. I think that comics have their sort of their own unique, your, their own uniqueness. And I think that that's important to sort of like take a step back and say, yeah, you know, the things that John Byrne did with X-Men or the things that Bill Sienkiewicz did with New Mutants or, you know, uh, somebody had brought up David Mack Kabuki um, in the, the Twitter thread when you had posted the question earlier. The like I said, like the story might come across in a film or the ideas might come across in a film, but not necessarily the visuals. And you can't do like a one to one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, completely. It's interesting, I think, to just topically the difference between the way stories are told medium to medium, even in similar mediums. Yeah, exactly. Like they're both visual medium, but but mediums, but one is you know one is static and you find you there there are ways to make it appear like there is movement and motion um but you know the fact of the matter is it's it's images on a piece of paper or images on a screen um you know if you're talking about digital so so uh here's something i've wanted to ask you since the beginning who is your internal superhero uh, you wake up one day, you're imbued with special powers and abilities. What does that person do? What do they look like? So I wake up with superpowers? Yes, please. So I wake up with superpowers. What superpowers do I have and what, what do I do with them, kind of? Exactly. Okay. I would go with a combination of telekinesis and invisibility. And first I would use it to play pranks on my husband. Nice. Then, I don't know. I mean, 
I'm very lucky that I'm that I'm in a, a a decent place in my life where you know yes obviously you change these sort of like little things but I mean the the vast whole of it I wouldn't be I wouldn't change so I I don't know I mean you know you know what I might do I might like jump on a plane and maybe if I'm invisible well if I'm invisible people will be more likely to cough on me <laughs> I w- I mean, yeah. I was, and I couldn't, like, could I make the mask invisible? Like, man, see, this is a tough question. There's so many variables. But this is what I'm saying is, like, I I tend to, to overthink things. So instead of just, like, oh, you have telekinesis, you can do whatever, you know, I'm going to be like, well, like, do I get on an airplane? And, you know, my husband and I were just talking about ancient Egypt, and I thought it would be amazing to see the pyramids, but there's COVID, so people are going to cough on me, even if I'm invisible. Am I invisible to the point where, like, they can, like, am I invisible, like, Kitty Pride, where they can, like, go through me? Am I, like, sitting in the same seat as somebody on the airplane? Like, you see how far my brain takes this? As opposed to just being like, oh, you're invisible, cool. You know, you can uh, go to a movie theater and watch free movies. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what I would do. I think I would like, I think I would just like, you know, play tricks on my husband and, you know, pet my cat from across the room with having, without having to constantly get up and go over and then pet him. I would like pet him from across the room. Oh, nice. That would be a great use for telekinesis. I know. It's so boring. No. No, I don't think that's boring so at all. Boring. Oh, that's pretty yeah. awesome. We have so much snow here. I mean, I wouldn't be able to get away with anything as invisible because there'd be tracks in the snow everywhere. <laughs> Unless you were weightless or, or if you were like Kitty Pride and you phased through things. Yeah, well, that's the thing is like, is, is that part of the invisibility? Because if that was the case, then sure, I'd like, you know, phase through everybody's coughs and go to the airport and maybe like go someplace fancy. Or maybe I'd like show up at my mom's house and just be like, I'm here, but you can't see me. Don't cough on me kind of thing. Um, yeah, COVID's made me like, I mean, paranoid is probably not even the right phrase. Like, I like, I never want to leave my house, but I do because I teach in person at the school, but you know, I'm all masked up and everything. And I use hand sanitizer like 900 times a day. Yeah. I don't know what I would do. I mean, if I could fly, I, I was stupid to pick invisibility and telekinesis. Like if I had telekinesis, like powerful enough where I could like fly, like a Jean Grey kind of thing, then maybe I'd like go flying somewhere and like, you know, hang out with like some birds or maybe I'd like follow a group of geese to Canada or didn't know, sorry, they fly south for the winter. Duh, I'm an idiot. Um, you know, follow them to like, you know, Mexico or something and like hang out. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm legitimately a very boring person. You know, like Netflix and chill is pretty much like my life. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not like somebody who's like looking for too much adventure. I, I, I lived, trust me, I lived my twenties. Uh, I don't need so much more adventure now that, it, now that I'm in my forties. So yeah, I'm just, I'm boring. I'm, I'm fine. Just like playing tricks on my husband and petting my cat from across the room with my telekinesis. Yes, I don't think you're boring at all, by the way. I mean, just after listening to you speak, I, I don't, I do not think you're boring. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So I guess that's it. I guess that's the end of our, our happy little show. And I wanted to, uh, to thank you for, for coming on. You have just been such an, an amazing guest. And uh, Thank you for letting me ramble. Oh, yeah, no worries. It's just been such an insightful interview. Where can people find you online? I am on Instagram at Erica Schultz Writes, W-R-I-T-E-S. I'm going to be announcing a Kickstarter that will come out in May called well i don't know if i should tell yeah well i already started instagram so it's called there's a comic called the deadliest bouquet that we're putting out carola borelli is going to be the line artist gab Contreras is going to be doing the uh colors and james emmett is the editor and um on twitter i am erica schultz 42 and you can also go to erica schultz writes w-r-i-t-e-s dot com i've got all the books that I have that I've put out, I've got all for sale on there. So, you know, feel free to pick up some books. I will happily, you know, sign books to people and send them out. And we got like a whole bunch of stuff, you know, M3 and 12 Devils Dancing, uh, the Mandrake book, and even some of the other stuff that I did when I worked on uh, Charmed and, um, and Xena Warrior Princess. We got those up there too. And now, babies, it's time to close the show. I wanted to say thank you for listening. 
supporting us and following us online. Our listeners are the best people ever, and we love them. Thank you. Titular Characters is a show about the people who create the things we love. It's hosted and produced by the adorable The Web. That's me. Illustrations and animation prerequisites by Lexiva, who is awesome. We love her. Opening theme by Antonia Marquis. Closing theme by Mikey Flash of Speed Force Music. Sound services by Brogan Malloy. Well, that's it, my lovelies. That's all we got. Join us next time for another exciting adventure in cyberspace. Love ya.